Good evening. We are starting on time this evening for Bake High. This is our monthly program. We've only missed two programs since 1989 on a second Tuesday of every month. And um, so tonight, um, I want to introduce uh, that we are going to be talking about strategic story design, framing storytelling when you have something important to communicate. Kendra Valentine uh, of KendraValentine.com will be, will be um, presenting. But just to give you a little bit of background, Bake High has been around for a while. And at times it has been the biggest uh, uh, Bake High, uh, Kai, um, sub subgroup in the world. Um, uh, ACM, it's our, our, our mothership, is a very big organization, Association for Computing Machinery. And there are 6,000 people in Sig Chi. The annual conference is coming up for uh, just about now. Um, and that is a fantastic event you should go to if you haven't, where, you know, it's the premier place to publish works uh, on research on user uh, interface and also design issues and the future of interface. Um, <clears throat> we have. Um, in the last month, we went on a field trip to uh, Inner Surgical to experience uh, working with a robot to, to uh, do surgery. Um, the interface of that's quite interesting. It's 3D. Uh, we are going to have a program in August, I believe, at the moment, uh, where we go to um, see a drone uh, company, and we will have the talk at their facility. Uh, so our program on uh, will be David Merrill's company um, in, in August. Um, <clears throat> in June, uh, coming up next month, we are going to have Moonshots. It's a book that's just coming out, written by uh, Tamara Carlton and Bill Cockaine, about um, envisioning the future. Um, we have a birds of a feather that groups uh, that comes together every fourth Tuesday um, of, of, of uh, a month. And that is at 7.30. Um, and people that are interested in talking about careers or about their career or mentoring other people in their careers for uh, HCI, please come. Um, Edwin Lee uh, hosts that in general. We also sometimes have a, a third Tuesday um, <clears throat> meeting about tools. Uh, I really love the idea of us having more people engaged. And when people show interest, we will continue having uh, meetings where we get together and demonstrate different tools that people uh, use in HCI. So far, we've talked about um, OBS for broadcasting. Uh, we've talked about Figma for, for, for prototyping. There's so many more we can talk about. Um, and I encourage everybody uh, to, to join Beikai. Certainly if you go on one of these field trips, you have to have, uh, be a member to be on them. And they've been a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, we are expecting that um, we're going to try to have our program meetings in interesting places. Sometimes we've had them, we had them in a VMware, one at SAP, one at um, Intuit. Um, and then we're gonna have one at a drone company. So we, um, that, that's, a, that's one way of, 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 of getting together. Uh, and the point is that I think it's getting to be close to time for us to start meeting again together. So that's gonna be a lot of fun, I, I'm sure. Um, and so the other thing that's happening is that in uh, next month, we're going to ch choose who gets to run Beikai. Quite frankly, if anybody's interested in being uh, either the president, vice ch uh, the chair, I'm the vice, the chair, vice chair, that's Edwin Lee, or the treasurer, we are delighted to work with you to think about what it would take, uh, what you'd like, what you'd have to do, what it'd be like. Um, we also are interested in um, maybe getting a different program chair. Uh, we have two of them right now, and uh, one of our program chairs is thinking of taking, you know, of, of, of reducing their efforts. Um, we are, um, Many, many things that you can do with Beikai. Um, you can help us and, you know, make our website better um, and, and many, many other things. We are currently, for example, um, taking decades of videotapes and putting them on YouTube 
put him back onto the program. So when you go back on the calendar, you can find more and more of the videos of these talks that have been given over the years. And obviously these, these talks are a lot of fun. Don Norman spoke last time, Ben Schneiderman talked a, um, a couple of months ago. We, we have top uh, headliners from, from the whole uh, human computer interaction field that, that come and speak all the time, often about their books and so on. So um, contact uh, chair at, at Beikai or vice chair at Beikai um, if you want to talk to me or Edwin about these things. Um, and I, uh, with that, I want to turn it back over to Anna Marie Trester, who is here to um, to to preside, to MC over this over this talk. And so you can tell us about what the talk's going to be tonight, and yeah. we'll, uh, introduce the speaker. I'm happy to be here with you again tonight. I have been an attendee in person when I used to live in the Bay Area. Um, Nancy Frischberg brought me into the fold and um, I'm here in her stead tonight uh, to introduce Kendra Valentine, who I understand met Nancy at a Silicon Valley Swedish Innovation Institute summer camp, uh, which is really exciting. Um, Nancy is uh, out of town this week, but uh, knew that I would uh, be a kindred spirit with Kendra. Uh, we had a chat last week and we very much uh, vibed on all things story. I noticed today when I was doing some um, digging into her LinkedIn profile, well, and then her business page, KendraValentine.com, which you all should bookmark. Um, Kendra, you lead off with a quote from Josh Levine. And when I was living in the Bay Area, I was living with someone who worked with Josh at Great Monday. So that is a small world indeed. Um, so she begins her business page by saying, a good strategist has two core skills, critical thinking and writing. And if they are really good, pattern seeking. So Kendra's gonna talk to us today about these things. Kendra has a book proposal in development, um, sharing her um, approach to story design, strategic story design. She'll tell us about this today. And I guess what I would just want to say is it doesn't matter what you do, who you are, where you're at. Are you job seeking, job having, job changing? Um, you probably could do with some thinking about how to convey to colleagues and collaborators, not to mention employers, potential employers, funders, um, what you do and, and more importantly, why you do it. You know, um, you need to not only know um, what your proposition, you know, your project or your product is, but also uh, what is your value proposition. Um, so that you can then turn around and craft stories. So Kendra is an American with Swedish citizenship. She's lived in Europe for um, over a decade and is joining us in the wee hours of the morning. Thank you, Kendra, for being such a trooper. She has a background in film. Her academic training is in film studies and philosophy. Her master's from Stockholm University looks at media industry, and that led her to think about entrepreneurial thinking and strategy um, as part of an interdisciplinary program with the Stockholm School of Entrepreneurship, which is what brought her into um, our fold here tonight. So here we go, Kendra Valentine. Thank you so much for that introduction. I was just waiting in suspense. What is she gonna say next? Um, okay, so firstly, Thank you so much for having me here. It is very early here in Berlin, but I'm still excited to share with you guys because it's been a long time since I had a captive audience. So <laughs> get ready. Um, okay, so. Oh, and I'll just say, um, Kendra has said that we can chime in with questions when they come up. So please feel free to pop them in the chat. I see one already in the chat. I don't know, Kendra, if you want to address this already. Where's Let's let her know. get started first. Get started and I will uh, just know. Kendra, if you notice things in the chat that you find right, interesting. Right, yeah. I'm trying them, to. Or just wait till they're appropriate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I'm going to share my screen. Here's the chat. Okay, that's not pending. All right. Okay, so um, as was just said, um, feel free to chime in if there are important questions. Um, either we'll address it now. Um, I'll have Anna Marie kind of filter through and interject. Um, otherwise, we'll have a discussion at the end. Um, I want to avoid this being um, a lecture or even a workshop right now because I kind of valued um, this audience and having an a chance to exchange, especially since I am um, in the midst of going back and forth with the publisher about my book. Um, and actually, I have a great offer for you guys at the end if you would love to help me figure out the title. Um, so with that, um, we'll begin. Um, and this method I use for my work that I've developed over the last several years, I call strategic story design. Um, and that's me. I'll come back to this. Remember this. That is a digital cover, but it is the German cover <laughs> of Wired Magazine. Um, but of course, we should contextualize before we get into it, right? So why should you even think about story? And Marie just said some awesome points on um, how it's applicable to this audience, but really it is definitely applicable to everyone because our brains are built for story. Um, I had to explain this a lot in the earlier years um, to people because whenever I would mention um, I work with story, design stories, storytelling, a lot of people looked at me as if I should be walking around with dashiki and like a rain stick. Um, that was my trade, <laughs> storyteller. Um, but really it has to do with communication just as much because there's science behind it. Stories help us to rem remember cognitively. Stories also create empathy. So it helps us to connect chemically as well. Um, so before we discuss a topic, this might be the philosophy side of me, we need to get on the same page of what we define as a story. So we should really do that really quick. Um, so a story is the telling of an event, either through a fictional, um, transferring information or a point of view. And every story has a teller and a listener, which is very important. And I'm sure Anne-Marie has some things to say about that fact. Um, and so here's some examples of just everyday stories to start wrapping your head about around it. There are news, there's blogs, there's film. Religion is typically based purely on stories, um, songs books. Um, and oftentimes when I ask people what is story, or you might have the definition that a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, but there's one very important part of a story that we often talk about, especially when we talk about films per se, but not in the overall context of storytelling. And this is the climax, which I hope some people here are familiar with climax, hopefully. Um, right now, you have the conflict rising acting climax. I like to call this a story mountain. Um, so let's get our minds working a little bit. And I'm going to tell you guys a story, OK? And then after I tell the story, someone needs to guess what the story is. It's a film, OK? It's a major film. All right. So. We have a protagonist who starts in humble beginnings and then suddenly is called to an adventure. They leave home, receive training from a wise mentor, and then go on a great journey. On the quest, they face a villain, almost lose it all, but eventually succeeds and returns home a hero. Any guesses? Which film? Go on, you can, you can. Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. Okay. Any other one? Star Wars. I see in the chat. Harry Potter. Any other guesses? Iliad. The Iliad. Go back old school. Okay. All right. So it's all, it's many of them. This is something we call the hero's journey. Um, is anyone here familiar with this concept? right now or done any storytelling, know about the hero's journey, show of hands. I actually really wanna see this, I'm super curious. Good, 
Awesome. So it is the hero's journey. It was not created by Joseph Campbell. He popularized it, um, but Joseph Campbell actually studied mythology and religion um, and basically observed that many stories across countries, cultures, and time, and space, most likely, um, really resonated with this kind of story. Um, Human society run. We're not going to watch that. There's a little clip on it. Let's hear um, it. Huh? Let's hear it. Uh, it's a, well, you want to watch the clip? Human society runs yeah. on stories. They create our reality the way we as individuals see the world. They make us sad. They make us happy. They inspire us. It's no surprise that Hollywood TV and books bring in hundreds of billions of dollars each year. And it's no surprise that the entire nation, except for Ohio, was rooting for the Cubs. The eternal underdogs finally had their shot. It's why day in and day out, most people want to live the best story they can. We love good stories. At this point in human history, it feels like there are infinite stories, and we're told they're all different. But what if I told you the basic structure of all of those stories is the same? I'm not talking about the stuff that ends up making them different, like style. Just a basic structure for every story that's ever been recognizable as a story. Well, many people have tried different formulas, but perhaps no one has done it better than the widely respected philosopher and theologian Joseph Campbell. He developed the monomyth, also known as the hero's journey which he lays out in his masterwork, A Hero with a Thousand Faces. Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces, it wasn't a screenwriting book. It was just a book about a guy who grew up a Boy Scout and a Catholic who was really passionate about these Native American stories, who started noticing similarities between parables about Christ and like these Native American folktales that predated Christ and also had no way of, of, of being touched by Christian uh, culture. So he started, you know, his, his, his life work became comparative mythology and mythology doesn't isn't just stories around a campfire it's it's pop music it's it's the dream you're describing to your friend a subway it's 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 drawings on a napkin it's 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 basically everything indeed after years and years of studying campbell concluded there are characteristics of an effective story and those characteristics are consistent regardless of religion race time or ancestry it's nothing short of genius but what if you could simplify his monomyth into an even more basic structure one that helps anyone build a story well Dan Harmon, who we were just listening to, did exactly that. He created the story circle, a distillation of the monomyth into eight steps. He believes his circle is universal for any story in any medium. Before we get to the eight steps he sets out, I want to bring the circle back to its most basic form to first understand the theory behind it. So we have a circle and we draw. Okay, so I don't. <laughs> Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. There's a bit more of this. I think you get the concept. I can share the clip of this because it's 15 minutes long. Yeah, you can um, leave it on, you can put it on, give it to us, we'll put it on the program. Yeah, it's quite interesting. Only one thing I do not agree with in that clip, it's a bit clip, click baby, is that, that all stories have a structure. Um, it is the most popular one, but not all stories. And I'll tell you why. Um, so here we have plot types, which we don't. Kendra, can I just ask, we're seeing yeah. your, your intro slide? Yeah, you're seeing our, a... my, my intro slide right now? Yeah, we yes. have an advanced Strategic faster story intro design, slide. big high storytelling presentation. Oh, maybe it's showing me all I'm going through. Them. Maybe I'll stop this one. He could have got confused. There, now we just see you. Yeah, I'll start over because it was showing me it's correct. Is it correct now? Oh, yeah. It yeah. Says, it says many of them now. Yeah, good. So here are seven basic plot types. You, Depending on who you ask, some people might give you 14 different ways that you can tell a story or the plot types. But here are seven, which I think, and if you guys go through the list, you could probably recognize some of them, like Overcoming the Monster, David and Goliath, so on and so forth. 
But right there in the middle is what kind of where we land at with the hero's journey. So the question is like, why do we love this plot type so much? Um, and I like um, this um, summary very much um, from Sean Cohn. It says that there is nothing more powerful in the story than having a lead character desperately pursuing something. The reader or viewer cannot help but attach themselves to that character because they have they, um, they have objects of desire too. If the lead character in the story gets what they want, our brains are wired to believe that we can too. So with that thinking, we're going to bring this back to like brand story or business storytelling, which are one and the same, really. Um, so who is the hero in the brand story? And I think if you dig into it, it's pretty much well agreed that right now it's the brand, when it comes to that, you are not the hero, right? You cannot. Maybe a long time ago when you wanted to make content in let's say the 50s, you could get away with as the brand putting them at the center, um, but true storytelling always puts either brand storyteller, the customer, partner, employee, um, those people at the center. Your role should always be the mentor. You're supposed to help people on their quest. So with that knowledge, then what really is brand storytelling? We defined what the story was, let's define what brand storytelling. So let's, here are some examples that can be an about page on a website, photos, uh, on Instagram, fonts in the campaign. Um, this is an example from CDC, as we can see from their page. I grabbed this one because I did some work with the ECDC, and as you can see that they're featuring their employees, right, and their achievements. It would read very differently um, if an institution went and just started speaking about just their um, achievements. It just doesn't resonate as well. Um, and this is primarily because basically companies, institutions are not people, right? Here's another one. I like this one because they literally talk about this man being a hero. Um, yeah, so, but something else to consider in um, brand storytelling is that it's just more than just text, right? At first glance, we can probably assume that this is some thing that's supposed to be a bit higher ticket um, item, maybe a luxury item, just from looking at the sort of fonts and the colors and whatnot. Um, so, with all of that said, that brings me to strategic story design which is more or less a method I use to approach my work, um, specifically when I have, I myself or my clients have something specific that they need to say. Um, this is definitely important when you work in technology because you're trying to uh, explain your technology or explain how it helps, institutions for sure. Um, and even works in creative um, projects um, because it helps you to figure out the red thread in the story you're telling. Um, in order to edit, right? So first we're gonna start with the strategy part, which is important. With this, I start with something I call the brand brief. So this is a short document you can make in discovery, figuring basically what this business is all about. Um, it's something between you know, business strategy and a marketing document. It usually is a one pager and has all the details in the foundation of a brand. So some things that are including the company pitch, which we'll get to in a second, um, and the next two, which I think are very important, the mission statement and company core values. Um, Cause th in these two um, portions are kind of the only parts that can kind of personify um, an institution or a company, right? Because as I said, they're not people. Um, yeah, so you can go through this. So the next part is story, of course. And as we discussed, um, stories might have, when you want to um, approach it uh, with the hero's journey, a huge start structure that you want to go for, different kinds of structures. There are, um, in, there's social media, there's film, there's a lot of different kinds of formats. But before we go there, um, I like to do something called a story statement, or I call it now. We'll get to that later. Um, 
And basically it goes something like this. It's basically an approach to positioning statement, but with story in mind. So this is the template I use. Blank is a blank mentor that helps blank the hero to blank transform by blank, which is kind of a little snippet of how we describe this hero's journey. So in one of our examples, it would be Gandalf is a powerful wizard mentor, right? That helps Frodo the Hobbit, the hero, to save Middle Earth from destruction. Very high stakes there. I don't know if you guys can manage that in your businesses, but you might be saving Middle Earth um, by giving him protection and support via the fellowship, right? So we turn this over to, let's say, a value statement, something that's within board business brand it would be quite similar. Blank, your product and company is a blank, what it is that helps primary customer segment to blank with their primary benefit, pain reliever. And here, just as in the last example with the climax, it, this is the key to a really good story or a really good offer, right? By blank. So let's use Bank High Egg as an example. I just pulled right from the about page on the website, didn't do discovery. So I'm not sure if maybe you're changing your positioning, but Bank High is a Bay Area chapter of ACM, Sick High. Um, if this was an audience that was different than the people who actually joined, I might explain what that is first. Um, that helps or supports human computer interaction professionals, professionals with community education and service focusing on human system interaction. Easy enough, right? Well, I wanna give you guys another example where you don't have to necessarily put a lot of attention or to the primary benefit brain reliever or all of your attention rather. Um, there are other parts here, depending on how you wanna lead with the value you have. So in this example, it's very priority just to give you examples of how you can accentuate each segment of this template, but Farrah Frittata, this is fictional, is a women-led PR consultancy. So perhaps this is important if you're applying to a grant. Um, that's getting grants for women businesses. You might want to start with that. We're a women-led PR consultancy um, that helps artisanal food companies across Europe to grow their brands and develop community. So that's your my, my primary benefit, pain reliever, um, by finding product placement, promotional press, and partnership opportunities, right? Another example. So why is this important? Um, so... This template basically can serve as your pitch in any situation from casually networking to a blurb and press, your website. Um, and it can also use as a starting point on when you're doing um, content and copy. Um, so with this template, you might not necessarily publish it um, as a story itself, but it can be the jumping point for your next story to really hone in on what value you're providing and then make stories around that that illustrate that story. Um, it's quite simple, but it's not easy because it's your de facto business model or how you provide value. Um, so the next part would be design. So to help kind of hone in um, when you're telling these stories and figuring them out, because as I said, it depends on what kind of story you're telling. Um, if you're just pitching yourself or saying hello in a networking event, that's one sort of way to pitch yourself. If you're telling a story on social, social versus a long form article, there's different ways. But I have four pillars that I think about no matter what kind of story I'm telling, right? So this is things that you think about when you tell these stories. And you miss, there's an acronym, of course, because all great things help people remember, help. This is great, H-E-L-P. So first, there's four. H is how you help. It's the most important thing and that's where you lead with it. And that's also why in the template, I use the um, verb to help. Of course, it could be to support, 
uh, to foster, et cetera, et cetera. But hope is really important because people think about what's in it for themselves to begin with. Um, even before the information age that we have now, the uh, intention economy, people filter things to figure out what's useful to them. Um, so it's super important to lead with how you help and who you help really so they understand that's for them before they want to listen further. And that's also the reason why I developed this is because, you know, the Herald's journey is quite long. Um, and it's often used for captive audiences. If you want to tell a story in a huge presentation, um, if you're a C-suite executive trying to give a presentation, great, hero's journey. If you're already watching a film, great. But when you're pitching something, you have to get the buy-in first. This is how you do it. E is empathy for audience, um, which is super important to put yourself in their shoes. As I said before, you should use words that will appeal to them and that they can understand. Um, and generally, the more words are not better. Um, I work with really international audiences, um, so that'll get you <laughs> to get, um, really main, streamline your vocabulary quite quickly, but empathy for audience is super important. Less words, clear and concise. Um, and it can be quite hard uh, for people to kind of um, self-edit really, but oftentimes, you know, people actually don't wanna read for sure. They just want the information. So use less words and then proof for credibility, um, which is oftentimes really key. And as you guys know, I know you guys do a lot of research um, and things, it's immensely important to get buy-in from people. And that can look a lot of different ways. That can look like saying instead of this in the PR example, um, saying instead of women-led, you can say award-winning PR agency, et cetera, et cetera. So, these are the four pillars, how you help, empathy for audience, less words, and proof for credibility. And of course, these will align with a lot of these five tips, um, main seven strategies, lots of things in books about storytelling and strategic comms. Um, but these four, I feel like, are really the core and really just the core of them. So with that said, the truth, I'm gonna refrain, refrain from my truth and I'm gonna hold it for a little later in the discussion. Um, but I wanna leave you with one thing if you don't remember anything else is to just remember to lead with how you help no matter what. Um, because if you lead with how you help, you're gonna lead with the value you provide or your company provides, et cetera. And so it's gonna be much more efficient when you tell these stories. And that's it for now. Now. So I would love to start the discussion. Are you there? It's very tantalizing to talk about truth. Uh, I'm seeing questions that sort of hint at that in the chat. Um, the truth. But before, before we go to these, these more abstract questions, can you tell us a story about a story that you made that helps us understand how you, you know, how this how this has implement, been implemented in your life or in one of your clients' lives. Um, so, okay, we can go back to, um, cause I use the example with the CDC, but the only reason why I use the example with CDC is because I did a workshop um, with the comms teams for the ECDC, which is basically the CDC for all of Europe, for all of the different countries in Europe. Um, and they had an issue because um, they're not only are they um, uh, a huge body with different um, cultures and communities, but each chapter um, actually, um, uh, ch chapter, country chapter actually addressed different audiences more than others. So for example, this, as we know, it has to do with um, um, 
health and public health. So some countries would focus more on doctors and health professionals. Other countries would target actual um, individuals a bit more, um, the communities a bit more. And so they had a lot of issues with actually sharing knowledge between them because some were more comms focused, some were more informational and sharing, you know, papers focus. So what we did was I had a workshop with them all and we, I basically used this. And what we were able to do is figure out, depending on the audience you're using, how you should address them. So I don't have slides for this now. Um, in the case, using the CDC example, they make it quite clear that they speak to the public very much. So um, even though they're, big, they're the same body in a different place, the CDC speaks to the public very much. So ECDC, for the most part, um, were public professionals. So what we did was we used the template and said that the ECDC helps, okay, doctors and medical professionals to do this. And so we, they have them list, I had them list out exactly what kind of knowledge that they tend to share with these professionals. Okay, so when you're, um, okay, versus, okay, our communications teams on the ground, focus uh, versus um, communities, how do we address them? And so we plug these things into the template. And so they had a couple of different sort of um, positioning statements to work with. And from there, they're able to figure out, okay, what kind of stories we can tell to people to address these things that we help them with. Does that help? Um, you didn't tell a story just now. Oh. <laughs> okay. How about if you I, tell the story that, you, they, that, they, that they came up with maybe? Well, they, well, I don't know the stories they came up with because I helped them with the strategies to make the stories, <laughs> quite frankly. Maybe, maybe, maybe can you tell us a story that you, you started off with something that didn't work and then you fixed it and then it was really good? Um, this sounds very American to do. I can make up one. I do it all the time. It's the humble in me. Well, okay, I can tell you one. So I am... Um, one of my first workshops I did was with Techstars in Berlin. Um, so I came into the accelerator with a group, I believe, it really doesn't matter what the specialist he was, but I think it was, um, actually had to do with commerce, but it had to do with a lot of different co um, technologies across commerce, so that's not so important. Um, so I came in to talk about storytelling and then eventually did this workshop where I was working out and how to basically explain your value and to pitch. Um, and what we did, and I was sitting there, we're working with the template. Um, each group has, you know, two to three founders together working. Um, and at one point, someone comes in a bit late. Um, sits down and says, yes, no, no, we came late because we were talking with a potential bachelor. We had a meeting. I totally knew it was totally fine. They sit down. They're very proud of themselves um, that they had a very good pitch, um, but they're going to try my tip late, of course, because they're good sports and, you know, they're an accelerator to learn. They had it down. So we sat down. We used the template. Um, and then 10 minutes later, uh, one of them looks at me and says, you know what I just realized? I just realized after two months that our pitch actually doesn't even say what we do. <laughs> this is everything about the technology. Everything's about its applic applicability. All of this sounds great, but actually what it does, that little bit was missing. They had all the words for the market that it addresses, the technology, blah, blah, blah. Have been talking with investors, just quite simply. What does it do? Which with this, it was very easy for them to add that in. So, want another story? <laughs> you can tell me. Always. Story. Do you have another story? <laughs> you know, the thing is with this, I feel like the people who avoid writing are usually the best at this because they want to get to the point. When I've done this workshop with actual writers, they're the most difficult. Because they just 
clear and concise, kill your darlings, this, it just was quite hard. Um, so that's why I really encourage people who don't write, who have, um, who are neurodiverse, who are not, um, you know, English proficient, like definitely use this template. It helps you to remember. And even right now with the, these four pillars, these four tips, I use them when I edit all of my work. I use them just for myself. And I'm always reading everyone else's stuff. So they'll say variations of the same thing and then add on two things. Or, you know, so it's not contesting anything. They're not, it's out there. But that's just, these four things are what helps me um, to remember. Not more, not less. That's what I'm really into. And that's what we're trying to actually capture in the book is to make it not more, not less. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? Hi, hey Kendra, I have a question. Um, so I'm a user experience researcher and I was really excited about this chat too because a lot of the work that I do has to do with influence and telling a story. Um, so how do you suggest like I, employ some of these strategies that you talked about during this presentation to be more influential um because that's a lot of what I do in my work and I'm always and looking at ways to improve can we identify influence say that again what do you can you define influence for me really quick how do you want to influence yeah so with my work it's like I talk to participants about a specific product um and then I ask them like is it good is it bad how can it be improved and then I create that story to deliver to the designers or product managers mm -hmm. to make their product better um so that sort of influence where it's like I'm taking user feedback I'm putting it in a pretty package and then they make changes based on that to the product okay um so with the method, so there's three, three steps that I usually do, right? So mm -hmm. anyone generally consults will do discovery, right? So that's what I do. I call the strategy part, the strategic story design, the strategy part. So in that I do discovery, but from that I get a result. Discovery, asking questions, poking, prodding to understand the project or the business or the person. Um, but from that, I usually get what I call a brand brief. So it's a way to actually structure the information I get. I have a set of questions I use. If anyone's a consultant or whatever, I don't mind sharing, it's fine. Um, but for you, you're already using um, questions uh, when you're doing research, right? So instead mm -hmm. of discovering that situation, what I might do is continue with the way you're doing your insights and your research. And then when you distill the information, the nuggets of information you have, then maybe you can make statements from them. So if you have like user segments, you can say that this feature helps this user, user set, section to blank, to whatever, by blank, or could do that, right? And then you have the same thing for another user section when you're distilling these little nuggets, how to contextualize them. You might have these nuggets for this user group or this kind of, might have things that overlap, right? And then from that statement, you can go, okay, so if it helps people to do this, this way, like how, if you're talking about communicating it, it depends on who you're communicating it to. But then from that, you can tell stories and like how you can explain that it does that soon as you have in your mind. So if it helps you to, um, I don't know, save time is always a thing, then like, how mm -hmm. could I illustrate that if it's needed? I mean, if you're talking to talking to people who are building, that might not be needed. I think it might be just um, having this, like in terms of the value proposition, the positioning here and how do you provide value for these different like stakeholders, that probably would be enough, right? But then you can also probably give it to, I don't know, marketing or something. And then they can then from there, oh, it helps them to, it's actually helping them to, I don't know, helping them to work while they have children on their laps. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, oh, maybe in marketing, we can do something for social media or whatever to show this. Yeah, that's helpful. 
just kind of like focus. And then on while you're making the stories, just use the four pillars so that you're like, you mm. can edit, edit. Right. Yeah. I think that's helpful. Anything yeah. else? I'm yeah. looking at the four pillars right now and I'm thinking there's probably stories behind each of these. <laughs> I mean, I know you and I do sort of similar work. I think that less words that in and of itself is probably uh yeah. that's on everyone's list right clear and concise please be clear and concise it's so hard though it is it is hard and i and avoid using that because it's i mean less words it doesn't feel as it doesn't feel nice but it's international friendly and it helps the l in my help okay um it's, beautiful. it's um, but it's it's um it is, but the thing is, after you write, you can self-edit when you actually know what the purpose is. That's why I really like having the template there, so you already know what's the point. It's so then if you have something else in there that is a beautiful statement, then maybe that needs to be a statement you save for another situation. So is this template something you made up or adapted? Where did it come from? Yeah, so basically I, I created I, I made this, but it's just an adaptation of a lot of position statements. So a lot of people think that value proposition statements are position statements, but they're not. It's just a nerdy thing. It actually really doesn't matter in the end. But a positioning statement basically describes how you provide value to your audience or your customers, so on and so forth. But there's no set formula or template for that. It's, that's just the function of a statement. So there's no one way of making that statement. And so I chose this way and I also choose to focus on the help. And so I just use this for everything. Yeah. And then when it comes also to story, so if we bring it back um, to story and narrative design, um, when you basically try to say in a nutshell what happens in a film, like it follows very much the same thing if you break it down in terms of like narrative the structure. So. Yes. I see a hand, Susan. Um, yeah, it, this is really interesting. Um, and I'm just curious, you've got, um, you mentioned, you opened the conversation talking about the fact that it's so super important to listen as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious, um, and, and clearly your, the, your framework is geared towards helping people be able to take that in, but I'm wondering if you do any work with people to be able to listen to stories and, and, and really understand them and what they can actually take away from the story. Um, people, I do not personally with the listening stuff. I know someone who does though. <laughs> believe how marie does she's very much into listening yeah. um so is indy on the call yeah <laughs> i've you know i've done workshops in terms of um recognizing let's say and i've, I've done workshops with youth audiences in terms of understanding these concepts which can be for any age really you know what's the beginning middle of the end what's a plot versus this um but active listening, no, I probably could take some advice in that as well. <laughs> filtering, I could do though. <laughs> Very good at filtering. Um, yeah, if you have a long text, oftentimes a big, a good tip, you guys can report back to me if this helps you. Because I do not have, I don't say it because I do not have any scientific backing for this. But if you're writing something, explaining something, you're just writing, I don't know, or have a topic. Write for a little while until you kind of stop and then read down in the third point you say, usually you can just stop and you can bring that up to the top. And that's usually the point. Try this later and tell me if it works for you. It, it's, there's something behind it. Why do you ask about listening though? Um, well, the reason I the reason I ask is because I, I just happen to be involved in an initiative that's really about trying to use storytelling as a framework for for really hearing both the explicit kinds of things that people are saying, but also the implicit things and really and really paying attention to those implicit 
um, things that you're that you're can take away from the story. Aha, uh-huh. so listening. Was- yeah. Okay. Okay, I can see that. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and I think I don't know. I mean, I could ask you, and I could ask Anne Marie if you make a difference between listening, uh, and hearing or com- comprehension. I don't know. I'm noticing my computer's a little bit buggy, so sorry if I'm choppy. I but like- I think there is there is something specific to do with story listening, like listening for a story, listening. I think there is a way we are story blind sometimes. Um, we get so caught up in a story, we don't realize uh that we're hearing a story or that we're telling a story. I think a big part of this work can be just starting to recognize what is a story in the first place. Um, and that's exactly where you began, Kendra. <laughs> it's, it's- well, yeah, and, and the big thing is also, um, so when we go back to the hero's journey, so on and so forth, it's not the only way to tell a story, as we know, um, but it resonates cross, cross country, uh, culturally. And I think, when it comes to listening, that's also a big part. Um, there are cues, like when you just talk about story blindness, there are cues that we learn when we learn to listen for stories when, from youth. Or even now, um, when it's the age of when there's memes, we understand how to read a meme, even, even if it's not grammatically correct, right? We understand now. Whereas when they first started, you would have been like, what does that mean? Like, what, what, what is this? Um, so you just learn it's also a bit a lot to do with cultural context as well. Do you have any other questions? Well, there's a few in the chat section when other people are done asking questions. I was gonna bring the difference between strategic story design for communication versus other uses, Mm -hmm. I was gonna bring that one forward. Yeah, such as we use stories to do scenario design for user experience and also for um, uh, scenario design for product design. I don't know if those are so different that that you don't have much to say about that, but but if you do, that's interesting. Um. So maybe maybe this comes back to listening as well. I think it really depends on the audience, right? This is this is the only the approach to it is the same. It's just what actually results is the audience and the words you use too. Well, let's say I'm making an app to communicate with people. I'm making mm-hmm. a, a social media app. So what story? How would story strategic design story design help me in in thinking about how to design that? Or is that just really too weird a question no it isn't because first okay so when you start with the strategy right it's any it's akin to your business strategy or your marketing strategy so when where I come in you usually should have an audience you should know who you're talking to um if you don't you can pick general if you want at least know what kind of value you provide that's super important. Um, so when you know who your audience is, let's say you speculate that you want the app, you want it to target to teens or youth, or you want to target the app to working mothers. This is going to be different ways in how you address, how you talk about it, or even the features you want to put in it. So by sitting and thinking that out and writing it down, this is an app that this is an app that helps working mothers to do this set of things. Okay, this app can also, I think, help um, this group of people to do something else, plumpers to do something else. So you can write down these sort of scenarios or use cases for this app for the different audiences. And then from that, you can further ideate what features you might need or what or actually, you could probably ID what features might overlap. Use that to overlap. I'm, that's what I'm thinking, but I don't have your job. Could you do that? 
<laughs> Kendra, I have a question, uh, which is partially a follow up to what Ted uh, actually brought up. Um, would it be correct to say that stories have one pathway to maybe um, um, a conclusion? Uh, can we can we go with it assumption? Yeah, because I think in this situation, that's why I say you have something important with these strategic stories, when you have something important to say or something to communicate or yeah. it's a way of saying brand storytelling or business storytelling. These are all in the area of I have something I need you to understand. So there if they the stories that might want, want you to just con it's about connection um, and these kinds of things. There are these kinds of stories where there are some of these principles that will help this, but that's not the main purpose of the stories. So in this, these situations, yes, you, there is a conclusion or mm -hmm. in other words, there's something to information to be conferred. So if that's the case, how do, how do we tell stories that have multiple outcomes, multiple branches and multiple conclusions? We tell different stories. So each one is a different story then? I would do that. So, I mean, if you're doing a pitch, for example, with that template, you can have three different ones. You can have one that you would do if you wanted to be an investor. You can have one to do that's like on your website, that's publicly facing, depending on what kind of technology you use, because some words you won't want to use for certain people, or there might be a term that you want to make sure that they understand and it's in within a certain market. Yeah, I wasn't thinking in terms of different audiences, but in terms of different outcomes. Um, and this is typically what we face when we design experiences. Mm -hmm. Depending on the pathway you take throughout that story as you are being one of the cast members, if you will, then you end up with a different outcome and it introduces a different experience. So can you give um, me an example of this? Like how... What? Yeah, it's like a product use, right? Um, I mean, it's your designing experience. So like I just worked on branded theme park. That's an experience. Yeah, of course. Like if you go to What's Disney, any of the Disney World or Disneyland, Excellent. you know, you as soon as you walk in, you your your pathway of experiencing that um, uh, uh, park could be quite distinct and different. And it could be the same person. So when you go second time, you have a different experience. But there is a unified experience overall, the overarching. And yet you have different experiences in different stories every time. Right. So how do we address that? I think in, if I understand what you're saying correctly, um, it comes down to what your strategy is. Like, what's the purpose of the story? Right. So if the purpose of the story is to explain that the park isn't as crowded as it looks, or is it to explain that it's the most wonderful place in the world? Is it to explain what, like what the purpose of your story is will help you to figure out which one to use in that situation or how to position your story. So of course it's the audience first, but it's also like what you want to tell them. Okay. All right. Yeah. But they can be a lot. Yeah. Because you can okay. literally. Kendra, you had said. Oh, sorry. Oh, I'm fine. You had said we could help you name your book. Oh, goodness. Yes. We help you do that. Yes. So if anyone is interested in it, I will gladly offer our consulting for sure. Um, and I can send you the working proposal. At this point, the publisher would like it to be appealing to a wide audience. Which for me, if you guys haven't got it, that's like, what? That's not. <laughs> How can I do this? So. It has to have a title, it has a story in it, and a few other things. So if you're interested, please email me, uh, hello at kendravalentine.com, and I can give you a link to the proposal. You can go through and see if you come up with some good ideas. If you come up with good ideas, period, for the time, like I'm glad to help you on anything you would like to be helped with. 
Because this point, this is usually something I'm good at, but I'm struggling. <laughs> hey, there, a, there was a couple more chat uh, questions. Uh, I don't know if they're worth uh, bringing up. But what I wanted to do um, was ask you to speak to the most common thing people are talking about today, which is um, in, 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 uh, in stories, often people sacrifice truth to uh, support continuity. Um, and we see chat GPT quite, um, quite uh, you know, quite famously doing this. And I just thought it'd be interesting for you to talk to that that issue of yeah. truth versus uh, versus versus continuity, and then maybe also what ChatGPT has to do to help us teach um, storytelling. Yeah, I am. Well, in terms of truth, that's kind of subjective. But I mean, truth a lot is not subjective. It is oh, okay. you have provenance and you have fact checking. And then you have truth. And if you don't have those things, you don't know. Right. I edit Wikipedia too. So I'm, yeah. Um, I would say that, okay, so let's go with the truth first. I mean, I, it has something to do with integrity, right? Um, so I, that's, that's part of the reason why the, the, I, my approach to the work I do, I like to help, help people who are like founders or stakeholders and telling stories that actually apply um versus doing the same you can do the same job when it's just advertising you can kind of project what you want the truth to be or what the mission the message you want to have um there's nothing wrong with that but it's just not satisfying to me so that runs for telling story yes so when it comes to chat gbt i think that it is great for people who understand in terms of stories, how stories are built. So this is just opening up a new, another use case for people to actually understand um, comprehension, story, design, how they, like, all of these elements. Um, and I mean, in that same respect, um, so I, ha I just had someone who just contacted me again um, for an opportunity, she had to go away to be my assistant again. Um, and um, something I had literally paid her a year ago, um, I had chat GPD do for me within minutes for free. It's very straightforward assistant work, nothing that great. But what I did tell her is like, look, this is an opportunity for you to understand how props are written. And if at the same time you understand you're a very good writer, how stories are constructed, you'll understand how to deconstruct these things. And even more importantly, you'll understand how to, we're saying prompts, we're using these words, prompts, yes, create prompts for them. Well, you'll understand, you'll understand more easily how to speak to the assistant when you understand how it works and actually what you're trying to ask it to do. So I think it's, I mean, it's a loaded gun. But it depends on who's shooting, right? I, maybe that we should bring that up. Right? <laughs> you had a post on LinkedIn just the other day about chat. It lied. Yeah, it totally lied about my back. Oh, man. I was like, this is great. Um, what did I ask? Yeah. Oh, I asked. In, about a Swedish cooking blog? Yes. This has to do with truth. Very much so, yeah. It, um, I asked it. What was Americola Nariska, which was an old blog I had, food blog and YouTube channel I had several years ago. It's not online anymore. Um, but it got awards and has been posted in other blogs and there's articles and stuff. So there's tracks about it out there somewhere. And so what ChatGPT decided to do was attribute the blog to a Swedish woman, a Swedish named woman who I couldn't find. Um, and it's not so hard to find people in Sweden if they have any kind of electronic you know, trail. Um, and said it was a food blog. Um, it assumed that it was a different kind of food blog, but nonetheless um, said she was alive and well. Um, also gave her a couple of, I think, of my hobbies and uh, yeah, said that she's still creating content and blah, blah, blah. 
So I don't know where I got that. It was very interesting. And I almost felt like I was in a parallel universe. And that's also a use case. Like ask it to like write a parallel life for you. This is very weird. But I mean, it's, I mean, I, I think it's a good tool if you know how to use it, like any other tool that we have or can have or have had. It's just a tool. Was this the conversation about truth that you were queuing up as you were ending your presentation? No, it, well, partly. I wanted to bring up um, some things with AI because I mean, at the end of the day, it does write good copy. And the truth it is, there's structure to how you write. <laughs> There's there's no key to the there's no master key to the universe. Um, it's quite simple um, to just understand structure and lead with how you hope people, and then from that you'll understand the value you provide. But then it's just up to communicating it. So. Well, I want to thank you for a rich discussion. So many ideas to think about. I hope it was okay. It's been a while since I've been talking. I've well, been just and eating and talking to my dog. You've planted a lot of seeds. I think you're going to be getting a lot of people following up. I put your email address in the chat. I encourage you. Do it. Poke holes. I love it. I, I'm, I'm not, this is not my end all be all. This is not a book I'm writing to be a consultant and just, no, it's, yeah. It's collaborative work, I'm ultimately, yes. at the end of the day. I'm very, yeah, I'm super happy with anyone to ask questions, anyone to contest, anyone to all of it. Well, thank you for inviting us into it. Yeah. You've given so many, uh, so much food for thought. I guess it's no accident that you were a former food blogger. Uh, thank you for... Uh, yeah, sharing so many tips and techniques that, I mean, they may seem straightforward, but I know when people sit down and try to use these, they will realize how uh, powerful and transformative these practices you have shared really is. And I did it very quickly because I wanted to give you all, usually I would just give one, but I feel like you guys can handle it. You can oh. a whole quiver, a whole quiver yeah, full. No, and but you know, at the end of the day, it actually isn't. I, I I created it to make things like straightforward. The strategy, okay, you need to know what you're talking about. Ask these questions. It's good to have this discovery, so you know who you're talking to. When you do that, you'll be able to get the story statement, which is your pitch. When you know who you're talking to, your customer, blah 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 blah. All these things that you filled out in the brand, the you can fill that out. When you fill that out, you know what you're talking about. You can go tell stories. But while you're telling stories, just remember these four things. It's hard. No, it's almost it's almost like I, I, I want to print out these, you know, a few pages and fill them in every time I'm trying to write a story. Man, that's what I do. I yeah. still do it. That's, I read it for myself. I'm I. Um, seriously, you can talk about B2B, B2C, you're talking this, blah, blah, blah. It's very helpful. <laughs> Which reminds me to ask, can you share your slides? Is that something you're willing to share? Are those? Uh, yes, I have a version. And actually, I have a cheat sheet. Yeah. So on the slide, which one is better? I think. Yeah. The slide, yeah, the deck be very useful to post. Yeah. And we'll put, oh, we'll put the talk well, as a, on the uh, yeah, I can give them to some people directly, but we don't want to put them on the internet. For... Yeah. Thank you, Kendra. Okay. And thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, for... guys. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Story on, everyone. Bye. Good to see everyone. Good night, big high. Good night. Good night. Thanks.